We're ready to go. Okay. Hey, welcome to uh, Lewis Presbyterian Church. Glad that you are here today and, and glad that it's a beautiful day, isn't it? Those of you that are here, yeah, it's wonderful outside and uh, just a great day for Labor Day weekend. So hope you have family visiting or have some great plans. Even just getting outside and walking around, I think, is a great idea today. Uh, those of you that are joining us online want to remind you that today we are celebrating communion. So if you don't, if you need to, go ahead and make sure you have your bread and your cup ready for uh, for communion. Uh, just sit it on the table wherever you're worshiping or you're out on the porch or out on a bench somewhere, make sure you have your elements ready. So when we get to that point of the service, which will be right after the sermon, we'll celebrate communion together. Uh, just a couple of notes. Sunday school is starting in a couple of weeks, and I think the adult Sunday school classes, uh, Clarence's is already going on Tuesday nights, but the Jim Miller's class starts this Wednesday night, I think. So if you want to be a part of that, you want to Get in on the um, on the Zoom meeting and be a part of that. It doesn't matter where you're at. If you're here in Lewis or you're in in uh, New York or North Carolina, you could actually join that through a Zoom meeting. So uh, call in and and the office can fill you in on the book they're using and and the invitation that you need to get involved with that. Have a number of meetings happening this week too. If uh, if you're an officer, you're on a committee, just Keep an eye on Wednesday. You're probably meeting at some point that day. <laughs> I know I, I'm just going to turn the Zoom on and just stay glued to my screen all day long. So um, if, if you're on any committee or anything like that, you're probably meeting on Wednesday. Um, also, our life groups are meeting. Um, if you'd like to be a part of that, it's not too late. Let the office know and they'll put you in one of those life groups if you'd like to be a part of that. And also, Patsy's Bible study starts pretty soon as well, and uh, the office will have a list of when those times are and when, when you can be a part of that as well. Also, uh, I understand that um, Bible Study Fellowship, does that start this week? Yeah, yeah, if you'd like to join with that, probably the office, or I think they probably have a website online where you can get connected, and I think that's all Zoom or thing distance as well. We have a number of people in our church that are in Bible Study Fellowship, love to have you get hooked up with that to go even further in your in knowledge of the Lord. So um, we'll look forward to that as well. Let's go ahead and open with some prayer, and then we'll get started with some singing. God, thanks for today. Thank you for your deep love for us. Thank you that we're able to worship freely and to meet and to uh, honor your name this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us as we worship pray that you'd speak to us through the music and, and through the Word of God, through all that we do this morning. Lord, I thank you for the many who are following us online, wherever they are, and Lord, we pray that you'd bless those families that are that are away, and uh, we, we pray that uh, you, you would give them the, the joy of fellowship wherever it is they are meeting this morning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand up as we begin singing. seems to hide his face I rest on him 
to say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated and let's go ahead and join together in prayer. Um, before we enter into prayer, I remind you of stewardship that if you've brought tithes and offerings, to go ahead and put them in the uh, pail on the way out. And if you're uh, worshiping by distance, you can, uh, you can uh, do stewardship of your tithes and offerings digitally, or you can mail them in. And if you're not a member of this church, I want to encourage you to remember to tithe to whatever church it is that you're a member of, and to remember to honor the Lord with your gifts to your church. Also, uh, uh, being a steward is not just money. It's also offering your life to Christ in service to Him. It's your gifts, your abilities, your... Um, your time, your effort, whatever it is that you have um, offered to the Lord, even hospitality. If you have a nice home and inviting someone over would just be a blessing of God to them, invite them over. Use your home as a means of stewardship as well. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, I thank you for today. Thank you for this day that belongs to you. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us as we worship. I pray that you'd lift our hearts up to you. Lord, we ask you forgive us when we've sinned against you, when we've thought thoughts that we'd be ashamed of if they were written out for people to read. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us when we've been angry at others, when we've lost our temper with our husband or wife or our children or the people we work with or even a neighbor. Lord, forgive us when, when we've been short-tempered and we've spoken without thinking when we should have held back. Lord, I thank you that through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven no matter what they are, no matter how awful they are. Lord, you forgive us when we come before your throne and, and ask you to, to take our sin from us. We give thanks that through your Son's sacrifice on the cross, our sins are paid in full and that we're clean in your sight. Lord, this morning we pray for healing. We pray for those who've had surgeries recently. We pray that you'd heal their hips, their knees, their backs, whatever it is that is in need of healing. We pray for those with cancer in our church. Pray that the medications that they're taking would be effective. We pray for their physicians, that they would have wisdom to bring about good results. And we pray for your your Holy Spirit to touch our bodies to make us well. Lord, ultimately, you're the God of life and death. You hold our lives in your hands, and we pray for life. Lord, we lift up our, our nation. We pray that you would heal our land. We pray that people would return to you. We pray that for an end to the violence and the chaos. We pray for safe elections, Lord, that, that uh, go smoothly. We pray for our elected leaders, our, our mayor, our... our um, uh, our county councilmen, uh, we pray for our governor, Lord, that you'd give him wisdom. We pray for our Congress people and our president. Lord, as we continue to go through this pandemic and difficult times on the, on the global scene, we pray for wisdom. Lord, we lift up all the ministries that are really cranking up this week and next week. Pray for those who lead uh, ministry groups in our church, that they would be successful, that We'd have a good start to ministry this season. And Lord, we pray for our missionaries. We pray that you'd bless them and keep them in your care. And you watch over them, Lord. Make them bold in their witness. Make them successful in their witness before you. Lord, many of us, we've come this morning with worries on our hearts and concerns. We offer them to you now silently.
And then let's pray the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing again right before we look to God's word. So let's go ahead and stand as we sing. Please be seated. God's word to you and me is found in Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. Listen to the word of God. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. And the woman said, to Naomi, please praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. And Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. 
He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And this then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of of Abinadab. And Abinadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. Let's pray. God, I pray for your blessing on your word. Pray that you'd speak to us in ways that uh, we can understand and that touch our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. C.S. Lewis was one of my favorite authors growing up. And I remember as a child in the 1970s reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. is probably his best known um, book series for children of all things even though he's written many, many, many more books than just that one. But if you say C.S. Lewis, everybody thinks The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe because, you know, it was published in, um, and, and made into a movie. And so that's how we know about it. I read the Space Trilogy when I was in high school, and that, that, that was kind of a scary little series about the revelation. And then, of course, in college, having to read the screw tape letters, actually, in English Lit which I doubt would even be allowed today in some universities. But back then, we were still reading Christian literature in in, uh, universities, so we read the the screw tape letters. Um, When I visited my brother, my brother lives probably about, I don't know, about an hour and a half from Oxford, England, and we were over there visiting. And um, one of the things I wanted to see was the Eagle and Child pub where uh, the Inklings used to meet with uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien and a few of the others in the Department of Literature and Medieval Literature, and they'd uh, meet there to talk talk about um, uh, about literature. And of course, his most famous book is Mere Christianity in terms of Christian circles. Um, I think Christianity Today did a poll of some of the most prominent Christian leaders in the United States, and they, they did a list of books that were most influential on their life. And at the top of the list was mere Christianity. It's probably one of the best explications of of what is the Christian faith. Why is it important to check it out and observe it? And so um, he's a great author, a great apologist, one of the the heavyweights in terms of theology in in our culture. Uh, One of his lesser read books, though, that was published posthumously after his death, was a book entitled, A Grief Observed. It was handwritten, 34 pages long, wasn't very long, um, but um, in the book details the incredible grief and loss that he experienced when his wife, Joy, died um, of cancer. Of course, um, uh, C.S. Lewis married very late in life, uh, the, the marriage was actually one of, of um, convenience. He was good intellectual friends with Joy. There was no um, uh, romantic interest initially. And um, she wanted to stay in England, but her tourist visa was wearing out. And so uh, C.S. Lewis says, well, look, why don't we just go get a civil s- ceremony and I'll marry you so you can hang around in England. And that's what they did. But that... that um, Marriage of convenience turned into a marriage of love eventually where they fell deeply in love with one another. Um, and so as a result of the, the result of his wife dying of cancer resulted in that book where he grieved very deeply. He was not a stranger to grief. When he was 10 years old, his mother died and then his father shipped him off to boarding school and really had no contact with his family until about probably three months before his father died. And um, so just a, a, a very lonely life from childhood, from 10 years old on. And of course, during World War I, he went off to fight in the war and experience the horrors of, of World War I. Became an atheist as a result, primarily of his the grief from his mother's death and then seeing how the world was and say, asking the old age-old question of theodicy, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? And he, his conclusion was, well, there probably isn't a God. 
after becoming a Christian through long talks with guys like J.R. Tolkien and, and studying medieval, if you read medieval literature, you can't get away from Jesus if that's your profession. You're going to see Christ on every corner when you study medieval literature, and, and C.S. Lewis did. And through conversations with the Inklings and with other prominent um, uh, Christian uh, academics, he became a believer in Christ. And, but what's interesting to him is that even though he became a giant in the Christian world, particularly in England and even over here in the United States, when his wife died, uh, the effect of it was profound grief, just uh, unbelievable grief. Even though he'd married so late in life, the, you know, and he knew Christ and knew all the truths of Christianity, the experience of grief was just kind of washed over him in, in overwhelming ways. Listen to what he wrote in, in, um, in his book on grief and loss, a grief observed. He said this. This is the, actually the opening line of his book. No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I'm not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering of the stomach, the same restlessness, the yawning. I keep on swallowing. At other times, it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. There's sort of an invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says or perhaps hard to want to take it in. It is so uninteresting, yet I want the others to be about me. And then the la just the last line in this little bit, he says, I dread the moment when the house is empty. Pretty profound. And he wrote this about his wife, Joy. Her absence is like the sky spread over everything. Lewis's um, reflection on grief is a reminder that death and loss can still hit us pretty hard. Even though we know Christ, we know all the truth of the resurrection and life after death. We know that this world is just, we're just passing through it, yet when we experience death and grief, it, it just hits us in the chest and knocks us down. And we experience profound emotions. The question that I'd like to explore today is, is there life after grief? Is there anything to look forward to afterwards? Is, is there hope? And I want to tell you right now that there is, in fact, great hope for getting through loss and experiencing grief. There's much more after we are hit with an, an enormous experience like, like loss and death and grief. But let's look at an example of how God brought about hope and redemption and restoration in the life of a particular person. And that particular person that we're going to look at is Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth, two people actually. It's a story of how God brought redemption really to a pretty hopeless situation. Do you remember the story of Ruth? You remember it from, from uh, Sunday school or from reading your Bible? Actually, a good part of the story isn't about Ruth. That's the name of the book. But if you really want to truly look at it, the story is a lot about Naomi. Naomi was an Israelite woman, and she was married to an Israelite man. They were from Bethlehem. There's a town you might remember. And for whatever reason, they decided to travel to the land of Moab. Perhaps there was drought. Uh, perhaps there was opportunity in Moab that wasn't available in in Bethlehem, and so uh, they moved the family to to uh, Moab, and there they had two sons, and then tragedy hits this little family, this little Israelite family that moved to Moab. Number one, um, Naomi's husband dies, and then two, ten years later, both her sons died. Now, they had married before they died, but um, they, they'd married, and then for whatever reason, maybe disease hit the land, maybe a a pandemic like ours hit it, but the two sons are dead. And then suddenly you have three widows living together. You have Naomi and Orpha and also Ruth. And Naomi's so deep in grief, she doesn't know what to do. So she tells her two daughter-in-law, she said, look, they're two Moabite women. They said, look, I don't have any future for you. You don't have a husband. It's time to, to get remarried and, and to, to start out over again. Just forget about me. Just move on. And Orpha, she, she goes on, she goes back to her Moabite family to hopefully find another husband. But Ruth says, you know what, where you go, I'll go. I'm not going to leave you. 
I'm going to stay with you. And Ruth was, was loyal to Naomi. And so they traveled back to, um, they traveled back to Israel, back to the land of, of Bethlehem. And, and they walk into the town. And it's probably been, who knows, probably 20, 25 years. And, and um, actually some of the older people recognize Naomi. You ever go back to an old place you've lived a long time and haven't been there in a while and you go back and, you know, people take a second gander at you because you're 25 or 30 years older and they think, is that the same person? And they take a look at Naomi and some of them actually recognize her. They're probably family members. And they said, is that, is that Naomi? Are you really back from Moab after all these years? And Naomi is deep in grief and she says this, and verses 20 through 21 of Ruth chapter 1. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the land has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The, the Almighty has brought misfortune on me. No, Naomi had hit bottom pretty much. She's a good Israelite theologian, and she knew that God is sovereign, that everything comes from him. She knew that there's no accidents, and she knew that whatever happens, it's because God allowed it, and she puts the blame squarely on God on this one, the tragedy that happened in her life. But God had not completely abandoned her. He would provided her with a daughter-in-law, Ruth, who walked with her, a, a living and breathing human being to walk with her in grief, and somebody who understood grief because Ruth's husband had died as well. She knew what Naomi was going through. And so they, they walked along together and came back. And Ruth, living in a strange land also without a husband. It seemed as if, if there wasn't a future for them. They were alone and widowed, which also meant in the ancient world, if you were alone and widowed, it also meant you were poor. That means you don't have money. You don't have a means of, of making a living. Um, you were... Times are going to be hard. There's no social security. There's no welfare state. It's only family. And so Ruth um, goes to work and she starts gleaning fields. And I love the concept of gleaning. Gleaning means that when, when a farmer uh, uh, harvests his fields, he leaves food behind. He leaves grain behind. He leaves um, uh, fruit behind so the poor can come behind and get something to eat. This is a, a principle that God put into place in the Old Testament law. These days, the Old Testament law is not real popular. People think it's all harshness and bitterness and anger and God's wrath, but tucked in are neat little things like this that God's written into the law of Leviticus and Deuteronomy that when you plant a field, when you harvest it, make sure that you leave some of the fruit of your harvest behind so that the poor can have something to eat. And so this was what Ruth was going, be walking behind the harvesters and getting what was left. And this particular field was owned by Boaz, and Ruth, uh, Naomi directed Ruth to this field because uh, uh, Boaz was a, a family person related to her dead husband. And Boaz saw the women in the field behind his harvesters, and he said, make sure you leave extra behind for Ruth because she's family. And so he took care of of um, of Ruth and Naomi, and and this isn't this God's way of taking care of us when we're in, in trouble and we don't have anything to eat and we don't have any uh, means to make ends meet. God figures out a way to to make it happen for us, and so they were provided for. The passage that we read today is actually the happily ever after part of the story. If you want to read the whole story, you got to start in chapter one and read all the way through. But the our passage today is, is eventually what happens is Boaz takes Ruth to be his wife. He redeems the, the land of the dead husband and dead sons, and Naomi suddenly is taken care of, and they have a baby. Uh, back then, having, having grandchildren, that's your social security um, program. There was no check from the government coming. If you want to make sure you're, you're taken care of, you have children or you uh, you take care of your nieces and nephews if you don't have children of your own, and you, you uh, 
And if you're old like me, you make sure you have grandchildren so you're, you're taken care of when, when things get tough and you get old and can't take care of, your, care of yourself. So this baby is the promise that Naomi is going to be cared for in her old age. Um, and, and family would care for her. And, and her great-great-grandson, this is the, the unique part of this story, is that God does some powerful work in this story because her great-great-grandson is going to be a guy named David. And David's going to become the most famous king of Israel. So in reality, this story is how did, how did David get here? He, he's part Moabite. He's not a purebred Israelite. Isn't that neat that God even uses surrounding nations to do wonderful things um, in this world? And so God redeemed a story of tragedy and loss and turned it into something beautiful. You know something, even though Naomi's story turned around, she was still a widow. The love of her life from youth was still in a grave in, in Moab. Even though Ruth was now remarried and had a baby, her husband, her first husband, was lying in a grave somewhere. And I'm certain that the scars of loss like this are still deep and they, they don't really go away too quickly. But God provided for her and surrounded with her to love with loving people to sustain her and and to to help her during a really dark and bleak time. God never walked away from Naomi and Ruth. He was right there. He was involved in their story. And you know what? We we read it from God's view. We know how it's going to turn out okay. But you know what? Naomi and Ruth, they didn't know it was going to turn out okay. They're stressed. They're worried. They're in the pit. But things do work out, and God, God was with them. Listen to the words of Naomi's great-great-grandson in Psalm 34, 18. David, that is. He said this, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God sees when we are hurting and when we're at our lowest. He knows when we're broken and we're in a dark hole, and he says, you know what? I'm with you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to pull you out. You know, there's been times when I've, not lately, but in the past, times when I felt pretty crushed and broken in a, in a dark hole, and I, I just thought, God, what are you up to here? But i got to tell you, it's at times when I've been at the worst and broken in body and spirit that God has been closer to me than ever than when times are happy and fulfilled. It's a strange thing, but I felt the closeness of the Lord more than anything else when I've been completely broken. It, it was almost tangible as if the Lord were right there beside me, speaking to me and feeling his presence. And I haven't felt it like that other than when things have been at their worst. And that's God's promise to us is that he'll be there when times are tough. It's in times of deep loss and grief that we must hold tightly to the promises of God found in Scripture. And I want to, some wise people that in my life, when I've been confused and wondering what's next and I'm worried, they've reminded me with these words, what is true? What is true? And for the Christian, when we want to know what is true, the answer is in Scripture and God's holy word. That, that's what's true. And so when we feel like we're lost and we're, we're confused and our emotions are telling us that our world is flipped upside down, that, that nothing is right, we, we need to remind ourselves what is true. And we look to Scripture. Listen to Psalm 55, 22. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. You know, when life comes apart at the seams, it feels like, we're being stretched beyond anything that we can handle. We go to the Lord and he says, I will sustain you. I'll carry you. I'll give you strength for what you need. Grief and loss comes in all shapes and sizes. The loss of a loved one, a husband, a wife, a child. Uh, the loss of our health. You get the, a diagnosis that tells you you're going to be sick for the rest of your life. And you feel like your, lo your life is over. That something was taken from you. And you, we grieve over that, don't we? When our health is taken from us. 
Um, you get a diagnosis of cancer or some degenerative disease, and you, you've been told you're going to have to fight for the rest of your life. It's never going away. You hang on for the ride. Sometimes the reality that a dream or vision that you had for your life isn't going to come true. Those of us that are, are, are getting older, those of us in our late 50s and early 60s, there's something, it's like somebody flipped a switch and said, okay, this is it. Whatever you dreamed about when you were 20 or 30 or 40, it's not going to happen. This is reality. And sometimes when that, that reality hits, sometimes we, we sink into a little darkness. And we experience loss, loss of a dream. And sometimes the loss of a dream is, is a powerful thing, a powerful hit to our lives. Whatever it is that has us down in a dark pit, we can depend on the Lord to pull us out of it. And I love the words of the psalm, the God who redeems our life from the pit. The pit, that's such a great word, isn't it? A dark hole you can't see, and the only way is up, and you can't get out of it on your own. You're just stuck down there about 20 or 30 feet, and then you're looking up, and there's a light, but I can't get to it. And I'm stuck. I need help. I need someone to throw me a rope or drop a ladder down. Someone has to get me out of this, and the answer is there is somebody who can get you out of that pit, out of that hole. His name is Jesus Christ. This morning, I also want to encourage you that you are loved by Christ Jesus and by his church. You're not alone. You're not beyond hope or redemption. Let me share with you the promise of God found in Romans 8, 38 through 39. You know, whenever we experience deep loss, everybody wants to go to Romans 8, 28, right? God causes all things to work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. But we forget to go to Romans 8, 38 and 39, which says this. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the message of this is that you are never alone. You are always loved. There's no sin that you can commit that will keep God's love out from you. There's no um, situation that will keep God's love away from you. There's, there's nothing that can separate you from God's love in Jesus Christ. And so this is a truth that I hold on to, and I hope you hold on to as well, is that you are always loved. You are always loved. Let me finish by sharing some practical and some tangible things that I think will be helpful. This is one thing that I found. Number one, when God sends help, it's usually a human being. A lot of times we pray and we ask God for help and we expect money to fall out of the sky or some miraculous thing to happen, you know, and, you know, God, I need a car. And Alakazam, there's a brand new Cadillac with my name on it out front. Or, you know, I, I, need, uh, I need healing, and we expect this, bam, you know, this sp hyper-spiritual experience where we're suddenly healed. But my experience of the way that God helps in this world is more often than not, it's a human being who knocks at the door. In other words, I pray for help, and God motivates some other believer, some other person to come and to help me, to walk beside me, to share the love of Christ with me, to give me hope, to offer practical help that I need. And so, you know, when we pray to God and we're, we're in grief, we're experiencing loss, and we say, God, I'm in a pit, help me out, more than likely, it's going to be a human being knocking at the door, or I guess of the 21st century, uh, texting you. <laughs> God will answer you with a text maybe of, hey, how you doing? Can I help you? Something like that. Number second, number two, grief lasts for a while. Sometimes it takes a few years for the rawness of grief to go away. This is particularly if you've lost someone who's been dear to you for a very long time. You know, you, uh, you've been married for 40 years. Friends, it takes longer than two months for 40 years of marriage to heal. 
if you've sunk 40 years into a loving relationship or 50 years or, you know, if your your father or your mother dies and you've known them your whole life and you're only 40 years old, that's still 40 years of, of relationship, of emotional engagement. And it, that's not going to go away in one month. That's going to take years, sometimes two, three, maybe even four years for the rawness to go away. And then the grief never goes away in this lifetime because we we have those scars of grief they're going to be there Um, but the rawness will go away i love psalm 35 it says this weeping may remain for an evening but joy comes in the morning the promise is this is that after we've grieved after we've walked through the the valley of the shadow of death after we've been in the hole the promise is that at some point god's going to restore us He'll restore our joy. He'll restore our, 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 the thrill of life will come back. That grief and loss will not go on forever. That eventually God will, will cause us to be able to live, live again and experience life like he intended it to be lived. Finally, God is not finished with you yet. I know this to be true. As long as you have breath, God has a purpose for you. Um, even with losses, you know, sometimes we experience the worst that can happen to us. And it may be that God's equipping you that you're going to be the help that is offered to somebody else. Because of your experiences, you're, you're equipped to comfort someone, to help them, to be beside them. Whatever that loss happens to be, whether it's death or some other kind of loss. God's equipped. God doesn't waste our experiences. That, that's my, my understanding of God's word, that all that we experience, God uses for his glory. And so God's not done with you yet. And there's joy ahead. And there's good experiences. And there's fulfillment. And there's things that God's going to do with your life, even after you go through, through grief. So I want to encourage you to look forward to what does God have next for you in this life? that he's given to you. What's he up to next? And there is a next when we belong to the Lord. There's always a next. Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for um, uh, your walking beside us when life gets dark. I thank you that even though uh, There's grief and sorrow at night. There's joy does come in the morning, and I thank you for that. I thank you for the example of Naomi and Ruth, how you use them to to help us deal with loss. Lord, today we're celebrating um, the sacrifice that your son made on the cross for us to give us life after death, to take away our sin and to bring us together as the body of Christ. And so, Lord, as we prepare for communion, we... we, um, We confess our sin before you. We confess any anger that we have against a brother or sister in Christ. We, as an act of obedience, we let go of it. Now, Lord, we come together to remember the sacrifice that you made on the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're listening from home, I want to encourage you to go ahead and Get your your elements, your bread and your juice. Have that ready for you on the kitchen table if that's where you're at or If you're outside, you better run inside and get what you need. And um, uh, I'm I'm glad that you're able to celebrate communion with us, even though you're not able to be here. We know some people. You know what? We don't stop celebrating communion, even during pandemics, even when it's not safe for us to go out. Um, We don't we don't give up the sacraments, even even though we can't be all together. And um, God did say that. uh, you know, the, the, the sacrament of communion was a, a, initially the Passover feast. And every family celebrated the Passover in their homes together. And so we, it's neat how as during this pandemic that we're going to back, back to some of that again. So let's go ahead and celebrate. On the night he was betrayed, after he'd given thanks, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread 
and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he shall come again. I'm going to invite those of us who are present. We're going to take communion. The way we're going to do it is we're going to go by the tables over here. You'll get the bread that's in the cup and you'll go ahead and eat that and and then throw the cup in the garbage next to it and then go over to the cup with the juice and take that and then put that in. Um, we're going to ask that, I think we'll start on this side and if um, try to keep six feet apart, don't bunch up. Of, of course, if you're family, you're allowed to bunch because you're all related and whatever you've got, you've already given it to each other. So if you're family groups, you can stay together and um, just come up um, a family at a time or a bunch at a time and try to keep six feet between bunches and people. And so let's go ahead and stand as we go ahead and celebrate.